Hi, this is part two of two videos on the topic of security as part of the IGCSE computer science course. And this is the, uh, the Cambridge version of the IGCSE. So if you haven't watched the first video, I'd recommend you go back to that first and then come back to watch this one. So here are some of the topics we're going to look at. So how do we protect against data loss? So backups and archives, physical security, audit trails, access rights, acceptable use policy and passwords and biometrics. So first up, let's talk about backups. This is the main way to recover data if you lose it. So if you have seen the previous video, we mentioned things like uh, viruses and all different types of malware that could um, lead to data loss. And we looked at topics like um, natural disasters and so on. So given that data can be lost, it's best to have another copy of that data somewhere. Ideally, that should be off-site, as in in a different location to where the company or the office is. Uh, so that could be as simple as somebody taking home an external hard drive with the data on it. Uh, but more likely these days, we're going to use something like cloud storage. So cloud storage, in case you're not sure what that is, is basically um, another computer somewhere else, but connected over the internet. Um, so we have these, as you can see in the photo here, like a big rack full of servers. And if you imagine a whole warehouse full of these, uh, you can think of you know the huge amount of data that companies like Google and Apple store for their, their customers. So cloud storage is basically um, sometimes paying or sometimes free, um, but getting access to a company's storage power, you know, through having a lot of, of hardware and uh, fast connections to the internet. Um, archives are perhaps less familiar. So archives are, are the same idea, but it's basically for files that you're not going to use very often. So as an example, a company might need to keep their tax records for the last five years, um, just in case a, a complaint comes up or uh, something like that. So they're unlikely to need to access the files, but they still are stored just in case. So most likely uh, with archives, there, there would be compressed files to, to take up less space on the, the backup device. OK, uh, another option which, in my experience, people often forget about when they're answering IGCSE questions is, is quite a common sense one, just physical security. If I want to keep some data safe, I can literally put it in a safe. I, I can store it somewhere that can't be broken into, for example. Um, we could use other methods like CCTV to monitor who goes in and out of buildings. We could have security guards on a building. Uh, all of these are kind of physical security methods. I believe you can get um, safes that are fireproof and waterproof as well, so that could prevent against natural disaster. Uh, and you could combine these with uh, biometrics or, or key cards to restrict access to the room that the data is kept in. This could be used for backups as well as you know the main server for a company. Okay, audit trails. So uh, this is a method of not so much preventing data loss, but keeping track of, of who was accessing a system at any given moment. So uh, if we think of maybe a banking company, they might use an audit trail to automatically within the computer system record things like every time a user logs in or every time a transaction is made. And then, you know, if, if something bad happens and data is lost, they can refer back to the audit trail, find out when the transaction was made and who was logged into that computer and hopefully, you know, take take action based on that. So it doesn't prevent data being lost, but it gives a way of tracking what's happened. And then another kind of policy is uh, access rights. So different users within a company can be given different permissions. And I'm sure you'll have experienced this in school that uh, your teacher might have access to things like changing uh, people's usernames and passwords, whereas typically a, a pupil wouldn't have access to that, that part of the computer system. So access rights is what it sounds like, giving different people different rights to access parts of the system. The technicians in a school or a company will, will have full access so that they can install software, but most staff won't have that access, as an, another example. And then we've got acceptable use policies. So many companies, and in fact many schools, 
uh, set these up so that when you join the, the company or, or the school, you're asked to sign an agreement. And it basically lists some of the rules for how you use computers within that, that company or organization. So as an example, it might include things like you must not use the computers for uh, social networking during office hours, or maybe you must not use them for anything that would be seen as offensive. Um, there may also be rules such as uh, pupils in a school are not allowed to um, download or, or install any software on, on the computer network. So again, the, these are ways of preventing things like viruses and other, other malware being installed whether it's deliberate or not. Okay, and then another obvious one is passwords, but you, you perhaps, you know, in a, in a question, you might be asked things like, how how do you make a strong password? So you're probably familiar with these already, but just as a little recap, we should think about using a combination of numbers, letters, capitals, and symbols. And generally a password should be, be above, for example, eight characters. Uh, because the longer the password is, the harder it's going to be for somebody to, to crack that password. Uh, especially if they were to use a brute force attack. You know, the, the more letters included, um, the, the amount of time it takes to crack that password jumps up significantly. We should also not use things that are easy to identify, like the person's name, their date of birth, the child's name, the pet's name, things like this. Because a hacker may be able to get access to some of the, that information in other ways that would then lead to you know giving them clues towards guessing your password and again a common sense one that we we should know is not to write down our passwords anywhere it needs to be something we can either memorize ourselves or um, even better use a, an online system which keeps track of all your passwords for you and then we have biometrics so this literally the the word if we break it down bio means body and metrics means measurements, so it literally means body measurements. A few examples on here, fingerprints, voice recognition, retina scanning and facial recognition. So um, these days many phones include a fingerprint sensor or scanner. Um, you can imagine a building, uh, you know, you might have seen on films or TV programs where um, retina scanning is used to allow access to a room. Facial recognition is used in things like passport checks at airports these days. So this is technology that's coming in and um, some people think it will replace passwords, but I think ultimately we're going to need to keep using a combination of both of them. So next we'll look at some of the benefits and drawbacks of each. So biometrics, uh, unlike a password, you, you can't forget it. You know, your, your fingerprints are always there with you, so you can't forget it or make a mistake. And it's difficult, not impossible, but difficult for others to replicate it. Um, so there are, I think there have been rare cases where there are people in the world with, with the same fingerprint, but it's very unusual. You know, it's, it's generally thought of as unique uh, and hard to, for somebody to reproduce your fingerprint, but not impossible. Um, but the downsides of bi biometrics, they're not always reliable. So for example, people's appearance does change over time. You know, you might, I don't know, do your hair differently on a certain day or you might have grown a beard or whatever it might be, be wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. So computer systems need to be flexible to, to cope with changes in appearance like that. Moving on to passwords, the benefit is that you can change them. So if for some reason, um, you know, we said it's difficult for people to replicate, but if somebody does manage to, you know, get a, a copy of your fingerprint from something that they can use, you can't change it. Whereas with a password, you know, if, if you're worried that somebody has hacked your account, quite simply, you, you can go on and change your password and, and restrict other people's access. Uh, but on the downsides, it can be easy to guess or, or to, as we said before, to work out through a brute force attack. Um, so, you know, as I said, a combination of the two is often probably more secure than just relying on one of those two methods. Okay, moving on, we're going to look at a few aspects around online security, so encryption, proxy servers and firewalls, and then SSL and TLS. So first the encryption. We don't have to look at it in great depth for the IGCSE, but you do need to be aware of these keywords. So um, encryption itself is the process of converting plain text into a form that can't be understood. Um, what, you know, scrambling up the text in other words, and once we do that it's called ciphertext. And 
symmetric encryption is the only type really covered in the IGCSE. Symmetric is what it sounds like, the same on both sides, so the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt the message. Probably the most famous symmetric encryption method is the Caesar cipher. So Caesar apparently used a key of three uh, to convert, for example, the letter A into uh, the letter X. So it's, the A has moved along three places on the alphabet, the B has moved along three places and so on. And having filled out the full alphabet, you would then come back and, and put the last few letters at the start like this. Um, but as I said before, the, the same key is used to decrypt a message. So um, Caesar cipher is very limited really. You know, there's only 25 possible keys. So uh, it, it's quite hard to to crack a message in the Caesar cipher, not very secure. Okay, um, so if we have a look at that in terms of how secure it is, as I just mentioned it, basically there's only 25 possible keys. If we move the letters 26 times, it'd be back to the start again. So between one and 25, well, a little link in with the binary topic here, the number 25, we've got a 16, an eight and a one to make 25. So in five bits or five binary digits, we can represent the number 25. So you could call Caesar cipher a five bit method of encryption. Um, these days in things like uh, website security, you're more likely to see something like 128 bit or 256 bit encryption. So, you know, I'm, I haven't put that on the slide, but you can imagine that that's a whole lot of ones and zeros uh, used to convert each, each digit of a message. So yeah, the issue with symmetric encryption is that basically the, per the people on both sides are using the same key. That's why it's symmetrical. So really you'd need to somehow get the key to the person at the, the other end. So if we were to use it for internet, which we, we definitely don't, uh, internet transmission, it might look something like this. You know, the data is sent across. Somebody could quite easily tap into that conversation as a midway point. You know, between your computer and the server that you're connecting to, there'll be many other routers along the way. So if somebody could take the data that's been encrypted and the key before it gets passed on and have their own copy of it, both parties would be able to decrypt the message. So for example, it, it could be somebody's card number and you would have no idea that somebody had taken that data along the route and intercepted it. Okay, moving on, we're going to have a little look at firewalls now. So a firewall carries out several functions. Firewall and proxy server, it's quite hard to distinguish between the two of them because they do very similar jobs. And in most of the exam questions I've seen on past papers, you can give either as an answer to these kind of questions. So don't overly worry about the difference between the two. Um, so a firewall can monitor outgoing traffic. So imagine these are some of the computers on a network. The first computer is gonna make a request to go to a certain website. Here goes the request. It goes through the, the switch and the server, proxy server to the firewall. So user jblogs was trying to access the block site instachat.com. So this could be a, a pupil in school trying to get on social network, uh, social media, and the firewall is able to have rules in place that block certain websites so the traffic just doesn't carry on through and out into the internet. And it can take a log of all those uh, processes, all those uh, transmissions of data going on. It can also manage the incoming traffic. So this time we've got fakebank.com is trying to maybe send a, a phishing scam to somebody. So the data is going to be incoming and the firewall again can block that and take a log of it, the, the fact that it's intercepted some data that was coming in. And then, you know, this, this kind of purple dotty line here is to represent the network. So it's like a line of defense a wall stopping the data coming in or out. Okay, moving on to the proxy server. Very similar function. Uh, this user here is trying to, again, access a certain website. But what the proxy server does, it can redirect the traffic to a stored page, which is maybe a warning page. So you may have seen this in school. If you've tried to go on a site and it's been blocked, that will be your proxy server. So rather than sending the data through to, let's say, instachat.com here, it just bounces it back in effect and sends you to a different website with a warning saying you've been blocked. And like with the firewall, it, it can block incoming requests to protect your network. Um, 
Another benefit of a proxy server, it can keep the user's IP address hidden. So each of these computers will have an IP address within this network. But in terms of other websites accessing, they will only see the IP address of the proxy server. They won't get to see the individual machine's IP address. And one final benefit of a proxy server is that it can cache data. Cache basically means a temporary store of data and it can speed up website access. So again, our first user here is trying to get to frib.com. So the request goes along, it go, it's allowed through the proxy and the firewall in this case, gets there and the user um, can view the website. So that website sends back the data the proxy server at this time is storing a copy of it in the cache, so like a temporary store of it. And then when other users in the same network here want to access that same website, we can speed up the process by their connection getting as far as the proxy server, and then the website here is sent back to those users. So it saves a lot of um, a lot of time, you know, makes it a faster process, and saves uh, having to send all that data across the internet. And moving on, last little topic now. Well done if you stuck with me this far. Um, so secure socket layer. So this is a security protocol where basically your computer is trying to connect to a secure website. So for example, a banking website. And obviously we need to encrypt the data that's being sent. We wouldn't want uh, somebody intercepting the data between our computer and the, the web server. So this is asymmetric encryption. Again, that doesn't really feature in the specification in terms of a concept, but we do have to understand SSL and TLS as two protocols or sets of rules for, for how this encryption happens. So uh, my computer here sends a request to the web server and the web server sends a certificate back to the browser. So here's an SSL certificate and it's going to send that back to my computer. Uh, and this lets the computer try and authenticate the certificate to see whether the website is genuine or not, basically. Um, so let's say this is a genuine website, it's been authenticated, and the browser then sends a message back to the web server and they can begin communicating. So it's kind of like an agreement between the two ends of this communication that it is secure. And if there's a problem, the browser will show a, a message to warn you. You've maybe seen this when you've been on the internet in your browser, something popping up and saying, you know, warning that this website is insecure. And finally, we have TLS, Transport Layer Security. Very similar process. It's just a, a more modern update of SSL. So it does exactly the same thing, makes web requests secure using asymmetric encryption. There's been one or two past paper questions that have asked you to break this down into two layers. So basically there's a handshake layer, which is where the two machines agree how the communication will proceed and things like what type of encryption they will use. You know, maybe it's going to be 256 bit encryption and a certain algorithm to do that. And once that's been agreed, then you have what's called the record layer, which is where the, the data is actually transferred. Uh, again, it's one of those topics you, you kind of, if you do some research online, you'll find different things in different places. But as long as you understand that core concept, I think you're OK. Um, you're unlikely to be asked to describe both of these in detail uh, because they're very similar. But you should keep in mind that TLS is the more up to date, the more secure version um, than, than SSL. OK, so I hope you found that helpful. I've tried my best to cover all the topics that have cropped up. Um, regularly in, in the IGCSE past paper questions. Please leave me a comment below and if you'd like to subscribe that would be fantastic or like this video. Thanks for watching.